Good morning and welcome. I'm Judy Russell, the Dean of University Libraries here at the University of Florida, and I'm very happy to have you join us this morning for this very special event. I'm going to take a few moments to introduce our speakers and then let them uh, share with you the, uh, the wonderful story that they have ready for you. It's always hard to introduce someone who needs no introduction, but for those of you who may not already know some of the details of his life, Bill Nelson is an attorney and a politician who served as a United States Senator from Florida from 2001 to 2019. A member of the Democratic Party, he previously served in the Florida House of Representatives from 1972 to 1978, and in the United States House of Representatives from 1979 to 1991. In January 1986, he became the second sitting member of Congress to fly in space when he served as a payload specialist on the Space Shuttle Columbia. We're very pleased and proud that Senator Nelson deposited a collection of his papers and other historical materials with the George A. Smathers Libraries, establishing a significant collection spanning his multi-decade career in public service. He also established the Nelson Initiative on Ethics and Leadership here at UF to offer regular ongoing series of speakers and seminars like the one you're attending today. This is the fourth program held as part of the Nelson Initiatives and the first one that we've done virtually. Future programs will include an in-person visit with the astronauts from the uh, Columbia Shuttle Mission when we can do that again as an in-person event. Bill, thank you so much for being with us today and for inviting Dr. Kimmerly to join us. Erin Kimmerly is a forensic anthropologist and director of the Institute of Forensic Anthropology and Applied Science at the University of South Florida. She launched the first investigation of the infamous reforms school, Florida School for Boys, also called the Dozier School for Boys in Mariana, Florida in 2012, and led a four-year excavation uncovering unmarked graves of many students. She found the remains of 51 boys who had previously been labeled as missing. She demonstrated that the students of the school had suffered from sexual abuse, starvation, and beatings. Dr. Kimberly used DNA analysis to identify the bodies of eight of those students who were returned to their families and appropriately buried. Senator Nelson pushed for federal involvement in the Dozier investigation and helped USF researchers receive a $423,000 grant from the Department of Justice, National Institute of Justice. That funding helped fund the DNA technology used to identify the boys' remains. In 2020, Dr. Kimberly was awarded the 2020 American Association for the Advancement of Science Award for Scientific Freedom and Responsibility. We're going to start the program in just a moment, but I want to ask you to look at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a feature labeled Q&A. As the program goes on, if you have questions you would like to submit to Senator Nelson and Dr. Kimberly, you can type them into the Q&A box and we'll address them toward the end of the program. So thank you so much again for being here. And with that, Bill and Aaron, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Judy Russell, and all of this is as a result of you uh, being so kind to help us organize all of this. We've uh, had, as you mentioned, Judy, uh, Marco Rubio and John Meacham and Senator Bob Graham as guests, and our next guest uh, last March was Dr. Kimberly. Well, of course, that's when. Uh, COVID hit, and so here we are, and we're doing it virtually. And uh, we will continue uh, to do some of these programs uh, virtually until uh, we get the all clear and can do them uh, in person. And by the way, to do them in person with hundreds of people in the main uh, library reading room has has really been a, an appropriate setting. So I am. Uh, I'm very grateful to Dean Judy Russell of the libraries at the University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Kimberly is uh, just an incredible person who um, started out as uh, a forensic anthropologist, uh, getting uh, her feet wet in extraordinary places all over the globe. And so, 
Dr. Kimberly, uh, tell us after you got your PhD at the University of Tennessee, you ended up in the Balkans, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, in Serbia, in that mass slaughter that occurred at Srebrenica. Uh, tell us a little bit about your experience there and how you got from the university setting right there on the ground in the, in the midst of a historical uh, occurrence that we didn't want to ever see repeated again. Right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited that we're finally finally getting together um, this year. I uh, really you know, loved and wanted to go into forensic anthropology because of the international work, this idea that you could take science and apply it to human rights work. And at the time that I was finishing my doctoral degree, uh, the UN uh, for the Office of the Prosecutor for the ICTY, which is the um, International uh, Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia, was hiring people from around the world, putting together very large forensic teams uh, to come in and do mass grave excavation, um, human identification, and really look at injuries and try and establish patterns of injuries because they were prosecuting for war crimes and genocide. So that was the work that really drew me to the field, and um, it was a really incredible experience. And I would just say, with that, um, you know, the work at USF and, and that I've done here in predominantly cold case and long-term missing persons, I think Dozier fits into this, is I've always tried to apply that human rights model and this, this idea that, you know, everyone should have access to the justice system. And so even though the work is domestic and different in certain ways, I think there's certain fundamentals about it that hold true. Well, there certainly mm -hmm. is regard to Mariana. Uh, in the old days, uh, we knew it as the Mariana Boys School. Uh, it, of course, is known as Dozier now. Um, tell us uh, how you first got interested in this program. You, now, you're at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Uh, what was it that called it to your attention? It was, uh, it was really a couple of people that got me involved to begin with. Um, Ben Montgomery was the reporter at the Tampa Bay Times doing really good investigative work on the story. It turned out we had, I didn't know him at the time, but we had a mutual friend, John Jefferson, who's an author. He introduced us, um, showed me some of Ben's work, and we all had lunch and then later uh, went and met uh, Robert Straley, who was one of the original White House boys, one of the, the, you know, the founders of that organization. And... Probably like most people, I you know started reading about it through Ben's work and in the newspapers, and just sort of thought, is this true? Like this, you know, how do how do we not know this, and how how come there isn't more being done? Because it certainly is within our our power and our ability and our knowledge today to find graves, identify people, you know, do some of the things that the people that the families were asking for, and that was the type of work you know I was doing every day with long-term missing persons cases. So it just seemed to me like a very natural fit to, to apply it there. Did you have any idea of uh, human rights abuses at the time when uh, you were reading Ben's stories? Just from the history, you know, from what he pointed out, the historical documents, but I mean, at the time and, and since, I think over four or 500 men have come forward um, with very similar stories of abuse. That was predominantly in the 1960s, but extended beyond that. And once you start diving into the um, historic documents, it's very evident. This, you know, this was a state-run facility. Uh, they reported to the state. The state did investigations annually, and report after report. You know, from the I think the earliest ones they could find were 1905. It was the same story: children chained to the walls, you know, forced into labor, not having enough food, and medicine. Um, and the fact that it was a school or a form school, they didn't have a teacher or books or desks until um, you know 14 years. 
into it, uh, which I think says a lot. So, it's yeah, this was a reform school that started in the early 1900s. And uh, I can remember g growing up as a kid, uh, part of my family roots uh, go back to the neighboring county to Jackson County, which is uh, Mariana. Uh, as a kid, when I'd be visiting my relatives over there, uh, as a kid, you didn't want to go to the Mariana Boys Reform School. It, it was generally known throughout the community. And of course, you look back into some of the civil rights abuses and the racial injustice, uh, there are the documented stories of hangings, of uh, lynchings uh, in downtown Mariana in the courthouse square. So uh, you were aware of this as you got into it. Did you think uh, once you got into it that you were gonna get any resistance from the local community? You know, at the time there was some, uh, I would say resistance to what the White House boys were claiming. You know, you saw this sort of counter narrative, like, well, nothing bad ever happened here. Or, you know, that was another time, right? Like bad things happened in the past. That's the past, let it go. But I didn't, given that even though, I, I really didn't expect the amount of resistance um, that we got. And I think that's what, you know, became, a, you know, a very tough um, fight and political fight. And uh, that was, you know, unexpected and just, I think, took a lot more than what we thought it would. Um, I... As I got into this story later on, uh, I can tell you uh, members of our Senate staff uh, were getting uh, statements made to them that saying, uh, you've done enough, you ought to back off, you ought to get out of Jackson County. Uh, we experienced some resistance at the state level as well, did you not? Yes, yeah. and. Um... There, you know, there were um, representatives from that area who, you know, would sort of on a daily basis, from what I heard, um, you know, bring it into the halls of the Capitol. And, you know, so for every supporter we had, it was like the, the, the voices of opposition were fewer but louder. And so it just, um, you know, really rattled uh, everybody, I think. By the way, um we uh, tried to get Ben Montgomery. Uh, mm -hmm. We wanted to give credit where credit is due because here's a, a good example of investigative journalism uh, yeah. that uh, brought this out. Aaron picked it up. I found myself in the right place at the right time to give some visibility to this. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Aaron has this incredible story to tell. Uh, it it even took you to Philadelphia in the exhuming of an mm. ancient uh, grave in a cemetery up there. Uh, tell us, what was that all about? Yeah, Thomas Curry was a boy who um, had come from Philadelphia. Both, both his parents died. He was orphaned, lived with a grandmother, was about 16, found his way in Florida, got picked up um, Remember at the time, there were a lot of uh, what we call like vagabond laws, and there were a lot of laws that were created um, in the Jim Crow era to pick up men and boys, put them into the convict system, you know, particularly black men, but anybody who was sort of out of place, uh, wrong place, wrong time, could, so trespassing, um, things like that. And so he, he was sent there and ran away. He was found uh, the next day, and the records that we have, the death certificate and the records said blow to skull or crushed skull. And it didn't, there was no other um, information than that. And then he was about a week later shipped home uh, to his grandmother in Philadelphia. So that was one where the, the defendant's family um, up in Pennsylvania gave permission to exhume him. And we thought that by looking at the injuries, um, that might tell us more about the mechanism. So what caused that trauma? 
um, whether it was inflicted or this was an accident or you know what what happened and and that that might shed some light on um, what we were trying to do. We went up there to excavate. I'll tell you, the process was uh, it was a night and day difference. We we always worked through local law enforcement. The local district attorney wrote the exhumation order, took it to the judge. They signed it. Their whole attitude was like, of course, you should do this. Of course, it's, you know, it's easy. <laughs> it's very easy up here, um, which, you know, I'm very grateful for all their support and, and uh, remind, you know, reminding me that that's what the process should be. And um, we excavated, but there was um, the bowl, like the wooden crate that he was shifting. Um, that was fully intact, and um, there was wood from the coffin, but there was nothing, nothing else there, no remains. And um, it appears, and we've never found him, but I, I think he was probably not shipped and probably buried either at Dozier or maybe at the state hospital. I just wanted to put that out to show you the extent to which uh, Aaron went in trying to track down the identity of these boys. So as the story mm -hmm. unfolding and uh, it's the words getting out there and uh, Robert Fraley of the White House boys is talking to you, uh, suddenly appears uh, an uncle from Lakeland, Glenn Barnado, who by the way, we Aaron has tried to find uh, to join us on this program uh, and uh, couldn't connect with him. But tell about Glenn Barnado and his role, and then uh, let's get into the actual uh, uh, digging and identifying the graves. Sure. Yeah, when we, when we, first, um, when we first started doing some of the field work, I, I did try to keep it under wraps and just get up there and kind of see what we could, what we could put together. But I um, reached out to all those families who had been public um, and wanted them to know what we were doing because I felt like this was very much, you know, even from the earliest days for them, um, and it had been their request. And so Glenn Barnado's um, uncle, Thomas, actually his father and his uncle were both sent there, but Thomas died, and he had, um, you know, um, had, they also had a, a living brother, Richard, who was um, was the youngest brother. So that family, you know, very much wanted to know what happened, wanted to um, find Thomas's grave. They wanted to bring him home. I mean, from the beginning, that was their goal. This wasn't new. They've been asking and going up there since the 80s. You know, it was, it's not like they just started asking. Um, at the time, the school was still open. It only closed in 2011. And so they just got, you know, uh, no answers really no no information and because of segregation uh and when the school you know was at its maximum capacity it was all all of that time it was segregated and there was an idea that maybe the cemeteries were segregated because they were unmarked it was unknown if they were being together or not and the school had closed so the state was getting ready to sell for a part of the property and that's when Glenn really uh, got concerned because if they're going to now start selling and developing some of this land and we haven't found the graves, you know, sort of all hope will be lost at that point. And so he filed an injunction and that um, required the state to, to not sell it until we could at least locate the, the burials. And so that was, that was good. It gave us more time. And I'd also just add that it ultimately helped open up the whole property. So the school had been 1,400 acres, so a lot of space, a lot of space to search. And when we asked for permission to look for and document the historic burial grounds, we were only given access to part of the campus, the part that was currently, or you know, at the time, uh, controlled by the Department of Environmental Protection. DEP said, yes, go ahead. The rest of the property was controlled at the time by the Department of Juvenile Justice, and they said you know, to access to the property. So that's what also sort of fueled Glenn because you know, we really had no ability to search or you know, get records, get the things that we would need to answer those questions. 
and this property, the 1,400 acres, is only uh, a small distance from the interchange of Interstate 10. Uh, and the road on the interchange splits the property. And by the way, as a child, I do remember mm -hmm. when I would ride the train and get off in downtown Mariana, and then my folks would take me over to their homestead uh, over in neighboring Washington County. If it was Christmas time, driving the road that went through the boys school, they had a beautiful Christmas display of lights. Mm -hmm. Now the road split the property. Yeah. Tell, tell about that. It did. So every, I mean, you have to just imagine the time it was like every aspect of life was, you know, influence affected, um, had to do with, um, segregation and down to you know and this like the very specific laws on distances like the dormitories for you know had to be a half a mile apart it was very like very specific and and it was in every aspect of life the only um like the trades what what education what jobs what trades they could do um and they called it colored so it was colored and white um it was also north and south one and two, uh, and so that meant like, you know, would you, if you were on the colored side, you could only do farming, you know, you could learn skilled jobs if you were on the white side. The only sort of deviation from that um, was the White House itself, which was used for punishment, and um, and that would, whether you were white or black, or you would be sent to the White House, and then put into isolation, and that would be segregated. But that's that's sort of interesting in that that was, uh, the discipline was the one area where that, that barrier broke. And then ultimately the burial grounds. Um, there was no segregation at all in the burial grounds. And we do see that in other um, folk cemeteries, convict lease cemeteries, um, that those sort of, the normal sort of like burial customs of the time break down. So you start the excavation, and to begin with, what were you looking for? And tell us about the excavation, and and you've got some slides you're going to show us as well. Sure. So let me. Um, what were you looking for, uh, Aaron, when when you started the excavation? Were you just looking for unidentified boys? Well, at the very beginning, we were actually just looking to see, can we find the burials and how many are there, right? So like there were um, crosses put up in the 1980s to commemorate, um, excuse me one second, I can get this to share. There you go. Um, that's, there were, uh, yep, that's the campus, the road you mentioned, uh, everything to the left was the north. Uh, colored side and everything to the to the um, right is the south uh, white side. And so, um, so yeah, initially it was the question was, can we find burials, and how many are there? Like, what what's the extent? At a minimum, families have a right to access those burials. There is a statute that gives protection for that, and so that was what allowed us um, to sort of document and protect a historic cemetery or burial ground at a minimum. And that's how it got started. And uh, now there are photographs of you starting the excavations that shows uh, some of the undisturbed uh, landscape. Uh, I think later on, you've got uh, pictures of backhoes that you had to use. Pick up mm -hmm. the story there, Aaron. Yeah. So initially we're using ground penetrating radar, which is a great tool to try and look for anomalies under the ground. It's non-invasive. We follow that up with what we call ground truthing, where we dig shallow trenches that transect what we think are the burials. I say shallow, it's maybe 50 centimeters. We don't want to disturb the grave itself. 
But what you can do is you can look at that soil above the grave and you can see where, a, you know, where it's been dug and where it's not. And so we had um, what you see this, you know, sort of color, <laughs> blue and red, you know, mess uh, on the screen. But that's, that's where we estimated the burials to be. And so we want to then ground truth it, dig some shallow trenches, look at the soil and say, yes, this is what we, you know, we're interpreting the data correctly. And that's what we did. And at that point, when we finished all of that, we felt very confident that there were um, at least a minimum of 50 big girls. And that was a lot more than the 31 that was expected. And um, in the end, because some of those were in fact under trees, we found 55 burials once we actually excavated. Speaking of that, you found a grave underneath a big uh, mulberry tree and uh, you had to go to the state of Florida to get permission. And they didn't want to give you permission for weeks. And you told them I didn't have the money to bring everybody back after several weeks. Tell them uh, what happened. Yeah. Well, we had a land use agreement with DEP um, that was the parameters in terms of, you know, what we could do and, and how to do it. And one of the rules was we were not allowed to cut down any trees. And as it turned out, the, there was a big mulberry tree in the, um, on the edge of where these crosses are. And remember, the crosses were just put there to commemorate. So they don't line up to specific burials. In fact, most of them were well into the woods and, and we had to clear, you can see the brush and, and everything we had to clear. Well, it turned out that one of them, one of the, the burials was directly under this big mulberry tree. So I asked DEP if we could remove it in order to recover these remains. And, you know, they wanted kind of um, typical process, write a, write a proposal, send a letter, it'll be reviewed. Um, and you know we'll get back to you. The, the problem with that when you have a crew and the ground open is the limited time and money, and it's very difficult to come back and, and do that. So I have to give credit. David Clark was the uh, was the assistant uh, director up there at the time. Was a great advocate and support. And uh, later that day, got it got it approved so that we could do that. And we. We ended up, we didn't cut the tree. We, we dug it up and replanted it. So I always, always tell people that tree is still there today doing fine. <laughs> uh, on your uh, ground penetrating radar, there are those big uh, blots of red. Are those anomalies or does that suggest possible burial sites? They, they are anomalies. That's what we're looking for. What you're looking at is um, just a slice. So think think of like a three layer cake, and you're just getting a slice in the middle. But when we look at the data, we look at all the layers, you know, all the way down and, and put it together. And so, um, but that's that's just giving you a slice of it, and that's what we look for. And you can see some of them, like on the left, are much too big. Um, we still excavate all those. We, we excavate this whole area and beyond to be sure. And what you also have is all the ways in which this land was used, right, for a hundred and some years. So old fence lines, old roads, um, in other parts of the property, buildings that were there that are no longer there, prior excavation. Um, this land was farmed. It was, it's now, um, or more recently had been used for um, pine tree forestation um it had all throughout its history been used for lumber clay mining for brick manufacturing so a lot of ways that the land gets used all that leaves you know a story in the soil and you have to have to sort through all that so that's that's how we interpret the data and it was it's a pretty pretty close the the ones that we missed were um either under trees or had just been wrapped in shrouds and there was very you know, it's very faint. So this is on the African American side of the road, uh, the cemetery, which uh, I think you said uh, is the north side of the road. Uh, did you suspect that there was a cemetery on the south side, which was the white boy side of the segregated school? 
Well, it, we thought it was possible. Um, some of the families, like Glenn, who had been who had been up to the school over the over the years, um, like in the eighties and at different times, had been shown spaces, you know, by staff who worked there that said, "Oh, some burials are located here, some are here," and they showed multiple locations. Um, not necessarily across the entire campus, but definitely gave us the impression that there could be multiple burial areas. And that's, we spent a couple of years searching, you know, uh, quite extensively for that. In the end, what you see, I mean, there are some rows and there's some patterns and, and it follows some chronology. I think for a good part of the history of the school, there was one individual who sort of served as their as their undertaker. He was an employee there, and probably kept a plot map. And you know, just like cemeteries today that are um, sometimes also unmarked, but the the um, individual who runs the cemetery knows the layout. And so I I suspect he did at some point. Just either wasn't written down or wasn't saved. Um, and there's no, there's, but there's no segregation within these burials in terms of. So they, they, they buried the white boys with the black boys. Correct. They, at the place called Boot Hill. All right. Yes. Uh, show us more of your excavation uh, pictures. Okay. So they're showing our uh, extensive searching and your, your, uh, that's with Ovel Crowell. She, uh, was a sister of one of the boys that we were looking for his burial as well. Um, did a lot of community outreach and um, outreach, you know, with White House boys, Black boys of Dozier, different, you know, people who'd been there, um, employees, people who lived in the community. So spent a lot of time trying to document that and, and figure out what we were doing. Some of the old buildings still had records, uh, still had you know information that was pertinent. So it was kind of a scavenger hunt <laughs> in that regard. Um, this is uh, when um, you came up, and this this was a really pivotal moment because at this point we still only had access to the DEP land on the north side. Um, and had never actually been in the White House. That had never been open to the public, in fact. And so, with with your help and support, that you know was a lot of the pressure and uh, the power needed to to get the public, you know, supportive and excited and and help people understand the issue. So um, I put some of these in from that event. You remember there are also community people who didn't support it <laughs> who showed up um, to share their sure. opinion. And very vigorously uh, resisted uh, what uh, was being done in the excavation. Okay, now that's the famous White House, and that's on the other side of the street, isn't it? It is, yeah. So with that, um, that you know, you were able to get it opened and permission to go inside. Tell um, what went on in there. So for for punishment, um, boys would receive basically a whipping. I mean, the school would call it spanking, but by all accounts, from I mean, you know, from the men that were there to congressional testimony by psychiatrists, it was it was whipping, and um, they would go inside and. Um, often leave, you know, bloody and, and by all other accounts and then go to isolation and sort of recover or heal. Um, so this, this was the first time the public was allowed inside. And they and showed you one of the cots. There was like a cot they'd have to lay down on and they weren't allowed to move or, you know, get up or do anything or they would start over with the whipping. And how would they... How would they so-called thank them? What would they do? They used a leather uh, belt or strap um, and would um, have them, you know, pull their pants down and would have them lay on the car with their hands up and not move. And was there suspected uh, sexual abuse? 
Uh, there were many, many, uh, many allegations of sexual abuse. Um, and, uh, and those came from boys themselves uh, yes. as old uh, years later? They did, yes. They came from a lot of the um, men who've come forward. Um, the one thing I would just add to that, in the 1950s when the Johns Committee um, was set up in Florida to, and they were set up to root out homosexuality and education, uh, three men were fired or let go from this institution. And as far as I know, the only, only record I could find of anyone you know, being let go or accountable um, in any way. Um, and it, it was said that they were let go because they were homosexual with the children. But we know that that is predatory behavior and criminal behavior today. It's just that in the 1950s and 60s, that wasn't actually a crime. And so um, I think that it's important though, because it shows you know, additional support to you know, what these men are saying, that there's, you know, that there's truth in that. So the name White House Boys comes from this uh, basically dungeon that was painted white on the outside where the whippings and abuse took place of which Erin uh, has just shown you the uh, photographs. And uh, then it was uh, told about uh, in a book entitled The White House Boys. It was told to you directly from uh, boys that had grown up uh, into uh, 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 elder age, mm -hmm. um, Robert Fraley. Uh, tell about some of those encounters you had with the boys themselves. Well, we did. We talked to many uh, men who were there, um, both about their experience, you know, in terms of abuse, um, but also just their daily life. You know, what, how did it function? What happened? Um, we talked to a lot of men about racism and segregation and what that. Ex you know, experience was like and how it differed, you know, showed us how it was um, a very different experience. Um, and some of them, I mean, some of these men, like, you know, shared with us very, uh, you know, personal details about being sexually abused. And it may have, and in some cases, it was the first time in their whole lives that they shared that with anybody. So it was very, you know, powerful uh, testimonial. Are most of the white boys gone now? Um, no, some some of the men who um, ha uh, helped form the group initially have passed away. Um, Robert Straley is one of them. We just became very good friends um, through this process, and um, sadly passed away of uh, prostate or of um, I'm sorry, uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, but many many are. Um, Alive, the organization is uh, very active. They've sought, you know, reparations and other um, reforms and juvenile justice reform. I think that's one of, you know, a powerful outcome if they can help influence that. It's not, you know, it's not that all of our juvenile justice issues are cured today. There's still a lot of work to be done, and so I think they've become a voice in that uh, area as well. So, Erin, uh, after all of your effort, uh, thanks to the what was then the St. Pete Times, uh, thanks to folks like Glenn Varnado, and, and by the way, uh, he was able to uh, take the remains of his family member back to Lakeland and actually bury uh, the child there. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, we found uh, Thomas. And, and so uh, as a result of all of this attention and your success in finding additional graves and the public seeing photographs like the one we're looking at now, which is a dungeon in the so-called White House, uh, then the whole attitude starts to change uh, at the state level uh, and you start to get the recognition. Take us through the rest of the story. Yeah. 
So, um, well, we, at that point, you know, and with your help, we got the White House opened. We started taking DNA samples from surviving family members because a lot of the families that we were working with at the time were siblings of boys that were that had gone to the school and died and, and were buried someplace. And they were in their 70s, 80s, and upwards. And so um, we wanted to get DNA samples uh, so that if we did get permission to exhume and yeah, that there would be a way to do identification. Um, it also got them into the system. And this is the thing I try and you know always explain to people is like, Today, we have some pretty good systems in place. It's not perfect by any means, but when it comes to missing persons and investigations, we have a process. When it comes to archaeology and historic resources, we have a process. But the cracks, you know, become significant when you have a project like this that kind of falls between both worlds. It's not a criminal case, and so it's hard. The, our justice system is set up for that. And so, and it's not completely archaeological. And that's where we just like hit all this opposition because when we um, filed an exhumation order, um, that was denied to the court. When we applied for an archaeological permit, that was denied by the Department of State. So it was like every system just closed its doors when it's like it could have been more open. If local law enforcement had said, hey, we have unaccounted for graves, basically clandestine burials, we don't know who's here, there's a lot of suspicious allegations, we're going to give it a modern day number and investigate, it would have been easy. Um, local law enforcement didn't do that. We did get that kind of support from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, Sheriff G, and, and that's what made the DNA sampling possible. Um, and that, and that made a world of difference. But what ended up happening, um, because all these doors were being shut, is that ultimately the Florida cabinet and um, Pam Bondi took a proposal. She was at the time the attorney general for Florida to the cabinet that basically said, as the cabinet, we own the land and we want these burials removed from our land, which as a private property owner, you would have that right as well. Like if you suddenly discover that there's a historic cemetery on your property, you have that right. And they passed it, and that was how we got permission. So it was a good workaround, but it was, you know, really out of the box in terms of all the ways that this would normally be done. So, okay. And are there any other photographs that you want to show? Sure. This is just showing some of the excavations. This is the um, with different graves opened up and the teams are working. A um, bit of an example of uh, some of the artifacts from the coffin and remains coming up in the burials. Um, this is like for all the science geeks because the way we excavate the burial, this dirt that you're looking at is the wall of the grave shaft, but the tool marks are the original marks from the shovels and picks from 1914 that were used to create the grave. So it's a uh, kind of a neat illustration of how our methods today can really get a lot of information. And this is the overall um, area where those crosses had been put in place that were showing that just the commemorative crosses, there were actually 13 burials within that area. So originally you had been told there were how many graves and at the end of your examination you had how many graves? Um, the school reported 31 when, so before us, FDLE, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, did an investigation. Um, they put together a list of 31 individuals that were buried there. Um, the superintendent said probably 31, maybe less, but better to have too many crosses than too few. So that's how they came up with that. And we found 50 individuals. I see. And um, 
explain how many of those were African American and how many white, and then explain you found a lot of others on the other side of the road as a result of a fire. Right. So um, by, by and large, the, the majority of boys who died at the school and who were buried at the school were, were African American. What skews that a little bit is a fire. There was a dormitory fire in 1914 that was the white dormitory. And the boys who died in that fire had been locked in rooms on the third floor. And so as everyone else was able to leave, they were unable to get them out. They didn't have the keys. Um, there was reports they were actually chained to the walls and chained to the beds. And so that incident, you know, obviously um, was a large number of white boys that died. And there were two staff that were also white that died in that fire. But I just mentioned that because that kind of skews the number if you look at that. So. Out of that, out of that incident, um, it is um, you do see a big discrepancy in terms of um, you know uh, being white or black or that is you know racism and how that played out in them. So, out of the fifty-eight graves that you found over on Boot Hill, approximately how many were African American? Seventy-five percent. I see. Okay, uh, Aaron, uh, looking back on this project, uh, since you are a professional forensic anthropologist, uh, what lessons in life did you learn from this? Well, um, I think what really struck me and it's it's taken a while I have to say I've had to had to step away from this for a while and, and kind of work through it but you know what what stands out to me is is really two things one that the past is the present we say we say that we we said that a lot through this project but you know what happened at the turn of the century mid century it is as relevant and impactful today in the lives of the people who are affected, their children. You see multi-generations of people with the trauma, those who um, suffered trauma. And you see that legacy, the Jim Crow, um, the segregation, where laws are actually created in order to incarcerate more children and men, where they're biased towards um, arrest you know, for people who are black or uh, marginalized or that is so, so relevant today. It's, you know, it's not just history and, and we put it on a shelf. And um, it has a lot of relevance to so many other contemporary issues. So I, I would hope like if people take something away when they read about this story or learn about this, is that same, is that same thing is that it's not just yeah something happened back in the day but that this is something we all live with and maybe don't see those connections but it's very real um the other thing i think is uh the opposition that ultimately we, we faced really comes down to like this belief system and the way people um put together their morals you know what their moral values are we, and for a lot of them, it was it becomes an issue of you know just belief and faith. And so no amount of science, <laughs> and facts, and, and data changes their mind. Um, and so that's what you have to learn to either negotiate with or negotiate around, um, because it was fundamentally a different worldview and and different moral system. And to wrap this up, and by the way, you can come back up on the full screen now instead of the photographs. Uh, to wrap this up, uh, tell about how willing the families that had been searching for years and years for their loved ones, uh, how willing they were to come forward and support you in this effort. And I remember that time that we got a bunch of people together where they were doing the, the DNA nose swabs and, right. and family members were so proud to sit there 
and, and contribute in some way in which you often ended up matching the DNA. Tell about that. Yeah, I mean, I got to know a lot of those families very well. Um, really just, I don't know, I just like, you just have, have so much, you know, compassion and empathy. Like I said, like Ovel Crowell is an example, went to the school in 1941 as a child with her parents to pick up her brother's remains and was denied that. So it's just, you know, it's very hard to get your head around, for me, like, the state takes your child and never gives them back, and then tells you for 40 years it's impossible. When we do this work every day, and we know it is possible, and so I think that when this came together, and, and they were, yeah, they're willing to get their DNA taken on TV and everything, um, it was like they finally were being heard um, and getting, you know, that access into this justice system that is meant to, you know, should be meant to protect them and to help them. And so um, that's, you know, really, I think what it was about, they were, they were very grateful. Um, Richard, uh, the brother of Thomas Barnado, told me that this, you know, finding his brother was the best thing that ever happened to him in his life. And uh, that's, you know, that's hard to, to hear. I mean, I'm happy that we could help him in that way. Um, but it's, you know, it's such a sad thing to have, have had happened. So. Well, you told quite a, a story, a true story, a saga uh, about a part of our past. As historian John Meacham says, uh, we're not a perfect union. We strive to be a more perfect union and understanding some of those imperfections are clearly important to us uh, in order to help us be a better people. And thanks to folks like you, Aaron, uh, that you've helped uncover that part of our history of which we can learn from. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Dean Judy Russell, uh, I want to turn it back over to you. I know we have a number of uh, very uh, interesting questions uh, for Aaron. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, Jim Cusick is going to handle the questions for you, so he'll be sharing them with you verbally. Um, yes, thank you, Senator, and thank you, Dr. Kimberly. We have quite a few questions. Um, many which touch on the same topic. So I'll try and group those. Um, the very first question that came in though uh, <clears throat> was from right here at University of Florida. And it was, um, was it possible to determine whether the boys had suffered starvation, beatings or sexual abuse from the physical remains? The physical remains were largely uh, decomposed. We had uh, bone fragments, you know, uh, dental fragments. So injuries past or, you know, or at the time of death, um, a lot of bone diseases or uh, pathologies that we would look for, we were not able to observe. We could see from the teeth and from certain um, remains, cranial remains, evidence of um, many, many like dental caries, so cavities, um, abscesses, very poor dental care. We could see hypoplasias, which can be an indication of uh, nutritional stress, as well as from something called Harris lines in the long bones, we could see nutritional stress. Um, we could see chronic infections, um, ear infections, but we were never, never had the preservation we would need to really say anything about um, cause of death. And that was one thing we'd, we'd hoped for, but the preservation just wasn't there. Um, all right, thank you. There's um, a second group of questions dealing with accountability. Uh, people wanna know whether <clears throat> administrators or others uh, at the school have been held accountable, whether any legal actions have been taken or suits for compensation. Yeah, so the answer is basically no. <laughs> um, 
they have, I know the White House boys and their attorneys have, fight, have tried for reparations. That would be their only remedy at this point. I don't know where it stands um, at this point. I, I just, I don't have that kind of um, information. But either um, individuals who are responsible have, were deceased or the statute of limitations had run out. And so they weren't able to, whether it was um, criminally or even civilly, hold them accountable. And then there was one case, um, at least, where um, an individual who had been sexually abused, and that occurred when he was under the age of 12, which would make it a felony, and it might have, and it would have done away with the need for the statute of limitations. Um, but it turns out it happened in 1960 when it wasn't actually a crime. So I'll defer any more on that to lawyers to explain. But um, but because of that, what we what we tried to um, tell people, you know, through this project and, and even, you know, state officials who are, who are getting on board to help us is that justice can come in different forms. And um, if, if it's not criminal, if it's, you know, if it's not civil, then, then what other restorative or rehabilitative types of justice can we find? Sometimes that's truth. Sometimes it's finding out the facts of what happened and acknowledging it when it's so, for so long been denied. Um, maybe that starts, you know, some process of, of peace or healing for victims. So that that's the sort of dialogue we try to, to bring up and, and to um, really challenge, I think, everyone to think about our own justice system and, and what the limitations are and how there may be other avenues as well. I suspect if there's going to be reparations, it would have to be through... Uh the act of the, the legislature signed by the governor, uh, somewhat akin to the reparations for uh, attempted uh, for Rosewood, the massacre that occurred in the early 19th. All right, thank you. We have uh, a question about whether you think there are additional uh, human remains or burials at the property. And more specifically, we have a question from an archeologist with Wiregrass Archeological Consulting, which is currently monitoring um, some work being done at the site. And they are working on the South Campus. And he asked specifically what you think the likelihood is of encountering burials on the South Campus. Right. Well, we did go back in 2019 um, for the state and try to, uh, we were asked to look at certain anomalies that were um, put out in a report um, by a, a different CRM firm. And those were not in fact burials. My, I will say this, um, we did extensive work with remote sensing, pedest you know, pedestrian survey, um, every sort of tool and t technology and, and method available for as much of that property as possible. Also with the historic record, I don't think there's a second or additional cemetery, like a, like a proper burial ground with a lot of individuals. Um, I, having said that, you know, could you have a clandestine burial of an individual from Certainly that could always happen. There's no way to search 1,400 acres, especially now that it's heavily wooded because most remote sensing is limited because of the tree cover or the, or the roots in the ground and, and you can't, you don't have to literally move every tree and excavate every inch. So I don't, I don't expect there is more, but I also, I can't say that there's not, you know, any additional burial. We do have, of the 50 that we excavated, we don't have that many names in terms of who should be buried there. Like we have five ex, you know, little extra bodies and we have names on our list. Um, we know those historic records are incomplete. So that's also, you know, one of the, the sort of legacy challenges to this. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Another series of questions has come up about local resistance to the USF archeological group. People wanna know why there was so much local resistance 
what it was like to work in that environment and how you overcame that as an obstacle to doing your research? Um, there was uh, the, the local resistance, I think, is a couple of things. One, the school had just shut down and it was a loss of, you know, four or 500 jobs for people. I think there was a lot of um, bitterness and anger about the loss of those jobs and that closing that was then directed towards, you know, all of us and anything related to the White House boys or our work, even though that was not why the school closed. But I, I think there was that association. I think part of it was also generations of the people who worked there for generations and they felt, you know, that they were protecting the legacy of their fathers and grandfathers and their community. Um, I think that the other factor and a really big component of it has to do with race and racial relations in that area. And the fact that um, it is still very seg segregated in a certain way and the power structure, you know, has certain attitudes and uh, beliefs and that you just don't get around that. There's just, you know, we would have a public meeting, uh, you know, try to engage people, get their input, get their advice, you know, find out more information. And depending on if we, who set up the meeting, um, you know, half the town wouldn't come. They wouldn't come if it was set up by the NAACP or in a black church. And I was not going to have separate meetings for people, you know, that I, I'm uh, just, you know, don't play that way. <laughs> and so um, I think that that was a big part of it as well. Um, okay. Uh, this is a question you're probably expecting, but a lot of people apparently have been reading Colson Whitehead's uh, best-selling novel, The Nickel Boys which is based in part on the work that was done at Dozier and the revelations that came out. People want to know, have you met him? Did you, did he consult with you in reference with his novel? Do you find the novel to be accurate based on your findings? There's a whole series of questions about you and him mm -hmm. and the novel. Um, I, I have not met him. He, 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 and we didn't, I didn't know about the book until it came out. So he, he had not reached out to us. He came to Tampa talking about the book and I went to his talk. It was very interesting and he's a brilliant writer. And um, I think that, you know, I'm grateful that he helped bring the story you know, to a better audience. I think there's so much to learn. Like I said, and it's, just, it's as much a contemporary issue. It's, it's not just a historical issue. And so, um, I hope that opens a lot of those dialogues, and um, and so I think that that's that's a you know could be a great outcome of of the work he's done. I have a question, uh, Aaron. Uh, are you aware that while this was going on in Florida, that this was going on in other states, and has that been uncovered? It's. I'm aware of some of the um, other institutions, uh, reform, you know, reform schools, sort of mother baby home prisons where, you know, this has um, happened as well. There was also um, right at about, well, at about five years ago, so after we'd finished most of our work, but it really broke in Ireland about the mother baby homes um, and what was happening with unwed mothers. And they, you know, they found 500 so skeletons of babies in, in the sewer of one of those homes. And I think ultimately use some of the work at Dozier in terms of how to navigate these, you know, you know, contemporary slash historic issues. So I think that there, I think it was a much more widespread uh, problem and issue, and um, probably a lot more work needs to be done to, to look at that. Um. All right, we also have a series of questions now that, that, that deal with the cemetery itself. Um, one person asked whether we know from forensic evidence, from physical evidence, that there were white and black boys buried in the cemetery or whether that came from records or oral histories. Another person wanted to know who actually dug the graves and made the coffins that, uh, for the cemetery. Um, and, uh, and we also have a question about uh, what the uh, 
primary cause of death for the boys was. Um, so in terms of the identifications, we have eight identifications based on DNA of individuals buried at Boot Hill that are both white and black. So we know for certain that they, that the cemetery itself was integrated. Um, it's it's not just the records. Uh, in terms of um, who created and how they created them, the records at the school, and then also there would be like um, reports. Well, from the school would make a report to the state every two years. But then the state would, the legislature would also send like inspection basically or a review and they would write a report. So a lot of those reports is also where we get additional um, historic information. So for the most part, coffins were made on the campus in the carpentry shop uh, by the boys. And the burials were dug and created by boys at the school as well. Some of the coffins early on or from the fire were manufactured, so they were purchased. Um, but the ones that were like homemade, if you will, and you can tell also, I mean, this, the material, the structure, but they would have, um, so like you make a wood box, right? And, it, and you have to support the base. Instead of any kind of corner brackets, there would just be like a hundred nails, like just extra nails to try and hold that support. And, uh, that you can look at the construction as well. But um, so for the most part, that was, there are, we talked to men who were there in the 50s. Uh, Billy Jackson was one of, one of the last, um, not the last boy that we know of that died and was buried on, on the property. And we talked to a man who was friends with Billy and um, helped uh, create the grave. Also, Thomas Barnado's uh, father had been at, incarcerated at the school with his brother and was the only one he said he attended his brother's uh, burial basically and what he remembered was this you know huge oak tree or you know huge tree and of course um, once that space was fully cleared there was a very large old um, oak tree on the north end so from you know those types of uh, accounts um, and historic records, that's how we were able to put together a lot of what the sort of practice, burial practice was. Um, the state hospital, which isn't far from there, had uh, so many deaths. Uh, they actually had a casket factory and um, an undertaker who every morning would go open several graves and I suspect and then the and I would just say in the 20s 1920s the superintendent from the state hospital went and became the head of Dozier so I suspect there was a lot of sort of probably communication and and you know like if they bought hardware and maybe it was through the state hospital that might have been a connection um okay that actually that actually touches on a related question, which somebody had asked, I think, when you were talking about Thomas Curry, uh, mm -hmm. what the link was with the state hospital in Chattahoochee, and they wanted to know whether other victims had possibly been taken there. Uh, it, it's possible. I think he was taken there because that's basically where he was found. He was found on the rail, like right, or right off the railroad tracks, um, close to Chattahoochee, and so they took him to the to the hospital there. Um, and they, and like I said, they had the morgue and the casket factory and everything. So in terms of other boys being sent there, I don't have any knowledge of that. Um, it's possible. I think nine, I think nine boys and all died after running away. It was a dangerous business running away. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Was there a question from the senator? Oh. No. Oh, okay. In, in uh, well, answer at all. <laughs> yeah. um, we have some questions related to DNA analysis. Uh, one person wanted to know whether you, Dr. Kimberly, had to uh, do additional training or specialized training to collect and analyze DNA. And another question came in about how the DNA analysis was funded. Okay. So um, the, 
the DNA from reference samples, so from living relatives who gave a reference sample, that was all collected by the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. So Hillsborough's here in Tampa um, under Sheriff G. He took a very active role in becoming a partner in this. And um, so they helped also locate additional family members who we needed to get in touch with, either because we hadn't met them yet or known who they were or to get a DNA sample we needed a maternal relative because ultimately what survives the longest and what we were able to use is called mitochondrial DNA and it's passed through the mother's line so sometimes it's not just having a relative you have to have the right relative and they're very good at finding living people that's what I always tell them we're, we're better at finding the dead and they're good at finding the living so they helped us with that we would collect the bone or tooth samples in our lab like we normally do in forensic cases. And then all of that was shipped off to the University of North Texas Health Science Center. So UNT is the clearinghouse for missing and unidentified persons in this country. At least they have been up until now. Um, we just learned that they're not uh, accepting cases anymore. So I don't know part of our uh, other cold case of crisis in this country. but. There, we would we sent that, and that was made possible because of the NIJ grant and what Senator Nelson helped us do with opening up um, that avenue through the Department of Justice. That's how they're normally funded, and so this fell into that system of missing persons, and then it worked pretty well. Um, it was just it had been that matter of getting them into that system. All right. Um on a, a slightly different topic, we've had a number of questions also come in from people who want to know, is there going to be a memorial to the survivors at Dozier? Uh, and is there going to be any kind of educational component maybe about uh, human rights and human rights violations uh, planned for Dozier? Well, I, I can't speak to the White House boys in terms of what they're going to do. I don't, I don't know. There was um, reburial of the remains that have not been identified or are presumptively identified, but we didn't have family for. Those are, those remains are buried in Tallahassee with the exception of the, everyone who died in the fire was actually buried back at Blue Hill. Um, we had hoped that it would be a very public event uh, and, you know, offered suggestions in terms of, you know, ways to think about memorializing as what, well, you know, besides just a plaque or something, but like, you know, sites of consciousness and, you know, just trying to think of education and other ways to, to do that. I don't know that anything is specifically planned or, or um, what's going to happen. I'm, uh, you know, we're trying to write about it, and um, I think there's a lot to be added with, you know, in terms of being able to use this as an educational tool. So I would like to see that go forward. There is a, um, the beginnings of an archive, a digital archive at USF Library with materials, and um, we're, you know, putting more and more of this um, catalog there so that at least the historic records that we uncovered and photos and artwork and stuff will be available. Um, ultimately, publicly that way. Okay, um, we have a few more questions and then some general questions about this program. But um, but to finish up with the questions about uh, work and about Dozier, um, someone asked roughly how long it took you to identify remains at this site when you when it was possible to identify. Them. So I think um, by the time we got every all the remains back to the lab and started that lab work and then sent everything out for DNA, it was, I mean, it was generally a two-year process. It didn't all take exactly two years, but just from sort of as we start to finish. Um, the analysis, um, what, part of what we did too, when we would excavate um, for like skulls, things that were very, very fragile, it's called in block. <laughs> And so we took, like, think of a big brick of uh, basically it's clay. And so we had to still sort of excavate that out at, by hand in the lab. So we did that. Then the analysis sent off samples. Um, at the time, there wasn't too bad of a backlog. So just under two years. Um, okay. And then there's a, there's a series of questions really about the history of the, of the school itself. Um, 
and people wanted to know um, how did boys end up at Dozier? What was the legal process for being sent there? Uh, they wanted to know whether specific communities or places in Florida were targeted um, as places where, where boys were likely to be sent to or institutionalized at Dozier. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone asked whether there were groups or organizations that benefited from the school or from promoting the school. Um, and finally, a question came in about whether families were informed if their son or nephew or grandson had died at the school. Okay. Um, so the school was set up in, uh, open January 1st, 1900. It had been, you know, set up through the legislature and several cities competed to get the school. People in the town came together, businessmen uh, came together and actually donated the land and some money to help get it started. That's what piqued uh, my interest initially in doing the background research because I thought, why do businessmen compete to get a reform school and donate land and money, you know, to help what, you know, by all accounts was a few wayward <laughs> children. At the time, remember there wasn't there weren't prisons in Florida. It was all convict lease system. So children who were in the juvenile or you know who were juveniles who were arrested ultimately were in the adult convict lease system. And there had been a big you know reform movement at the end of the 1800s to try and get children out of out of these systems. And so a reform school was ideal because you learn trades, you learn skills, and you're self-sustaining, and then you go back and be productive in society. But what we learned is that the group who came together to donate the land and money had all been um, from fam families who um, basically were labor bosses and ran uh, groups for convict lease. Um, they hired the boys out, you know, immediately for lumber, um, cotton, different industries, the same thing basically that you see with the convict lease system. It was just, it just became like a side branch of it and so people who benefited were those who employed the boys in the school and at times I mean they had huge turnover with superintendents one after another would get fired basically take school money buy the adjacent land in his own name hire the boys out then sell the lumber take the money he'd get fired next guy come in do the same thing so I always uh I always joked it was it should have been just like a big RICO <laughs> case from the beginning because you know there's a, there's a financial component to it. Um, what you see too is that the laws are changed. So initially it's um, children of a certain age, not orphans. You had to be convicted by the court. You had to be sent by a judge. But they changed what you could get convicted of if you're a juvenile. They changed um, the age parameters so that they could take them younger and older. It used to be a one, if you don't start out as a one year maximum sentence, then it was to be decided by the school. And so you see boys, now men, there until the age of 21 um, and then still hired out for labor. If the family couldn't um, send bus money when they were released, they would get sent to a farm to work where they had to earn their bus money. But in earning your bus money, you're also paying room and board. So that turns into a year of labor. Um, that's what really struck me, and that's where you see this, like all, you know, that whole Jim Crow era, you see that across the board for adults and children. It's, you know, now what's a crime? Incorrigibility, your five-year-old convicted by a judge of incorrigibility. And this is all pre-civil rights. There's no lawyers for the boys. Parents aren't notified or present. The sheriff takes you to the judge. The judge convicts you. You're sent to the school for a year. The family's notified. Child dies, family's notified. Many of them that we talked to, the, the siblings and the families, said they were notified by letter. Um, they weren't given, you know, little options for, for anything. The exception to that was uh, Ovel Krell, whose family had been searching because he had run away. They'd been searching for him. They were on, on their way up there to find him. You know, they were going to look themselves. And the superintendent called back as they were leaving town and said, oh, no, we found him. He's dead. Um, we'll, we'll bury him. And they said, no, take him to the funeral home. We're going to bring him home. And when they got up there, he was 
put in an unmarked grave. So. All right, we still have a few more questions. But before I finish up with the questions, I just want to note there are many, many expressions of thanks. Uh, oh, thank you. To uh, to both of you and to the library for putting on this uh, for this presentation, um, people have already asked whether it will be possible to go back and see the recording. So before we finish up, we should inform people that they you know how to get to a link. And then, and then Dr. Kimberly, there's been at least two or three questions of people wanting to know how they can access reports that you wrote about the site. Um, those reports, our, our reports materials should all be on the USF uh, library um, website if they look for um, the Doja archive at the USF library. Find it. What about your book? When is your book coming? coming. <laughs> it's in progress, but yeah, Har HarperCollins, um, so more on that. Do you, do you have a title? Uh, working title, uh, We Carry Their Bones. It's a good title. Um, all right, uh, final questions here. Um, a couple people have said this should be a documentary. Is there any evidence that someone's going to make this into a documentary? Um, we did, we did, um, one, it was for, um, it was, it aired on Lifetime Movie Network. It's a little hard to find. Um, that's called, um, uh, the, um, Buried Secrets, Children of Dozier. And, um, I'm not sure if that link is on the website, but it's, it's, that's been a little bit harder to find, but it's, they did a nice job in terms of like pulling together different families and, um, men who were there and different stories, and I, I thought it was pretty comprehensive. Um, and some final questions. Uh, someone wanted to know how long was the White House in use as a place of punishment? From the time that it was built, and I forget the year right now, but I want to say in the, um, I think it was between 1915, 1920, it was built. And uh, until probably the 60s, I think they they used it. Um, I would just say when, even when it was no longer permissible to whip men in the convict leave system, it didn't change for juveniles until much later. And so you see you see that persist pretty late. The men who've come forward are are you know were there in the 1960s. And it was still in use. Um, okay, and I think there was one last question. Let me just double check here. While you're checking, uh, Aaron, do you remember the name of the lady who was the head of the Department of Children's and, and Families that bucked the system and allowed us access into the White House? Um. I'm going to have to look that up. Sorry. Uh, and and uh, she certainly deserves credit. Yeah. Um, the, she was the head of the Department of Children and Families. And I mean, at that point, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And she stepped out on her own and said, we're going to do this. We're going to open it up for Aaron and me. To see. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. There were a lot of people, I would just say also, in, and even in the community and in the government that that really were supportive and made the difference. And at the community level, many of them would say, I support you. They, they, and they would say, I support Senator Nelson. I, I know Senator Nelson, we're friends, but I can't tell anybody. Like, we can't, we can't let it be known that we're supporting you. And so there was a lot of, sort of private support, I guess, if you will, because you know, they have to keep living there and, and, and you know. Um, all right, so actually we did come to the end of the questions. There are um, various comments in questions and answers of people just filling in things that they know about uh, the school or about people uh, that they were acquainted with who went to the school. And I will, I will try and make sure that I save all that um, so that we have those comments. Um, and uh, 
Um, and again, um, everything that's come in within the last five minutes is, has, is expressions of, of appreciation and thanks both for doing that project and revealing what went on there and also for informing the public in programs like this about uh, the results of the work. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Senator Nelson. Appreciate it. Well, uh, Judy, should I turn it over to you? Uh, obviously, for all of us, Aaron, thank you for the public service that you've rendered your entire life, but uh, particularly uh, the public service that you are rendering uh, on this continuing saga. Uh, and it continues, and we'll be looking for your book. Thank you. Be wonderful, to have, be wonderful to have a follow-up book signing event, which we might then be able to do in person. So we'll we'll look forward to that as well. But um, I, I want to join in um, also thanking you both so much for this. It's been a fascinating story, and as you say, one that we still have much to learn about in the future. Uh, Dr. Kimberly, I think Jim has said that from some of the comments, but we're also incredibly grateful that you and Bill pursued this and uncovered these graves and that at least some of these boys were able to be identified and returned to their families. Um, it's tragic that this happened, but it's very important that we all know about it and understand it. And so I'm grateful. And I also want to thank Jim Cusick. He's our curator of Florida history. So a very appropriate person to uh, monitor the Q&A for us. And thank you, Jim, for that. I want to say to those of you who attended that uh, it is our tradition to provide each attendee a Nelson Initiative event with a short publication relevant to the topic. And since this is a virtual event, we will be mailing each of you a booklet with a summary of Dr. Kimberly's work as a memento. And this event will uh, be made available online uh, for future viewing. We closed caption it before we post it, but we will also send you a follow-up email when it's posted with a link uh, to the event. And uh, then just in conclusion, I wanted to say that um, in recognizing Bill's personal and professional contributions to Florida and his country, we have an endowed fund that's been established here at the George A. Smathers Libraries to honor him and to support his initiative focused on ethics and leadership. The endowment also will foster research and scholarship through the use of his personal and professional papers and related materials that are on deposit in the libraries. So I hope some of you will consider supporting it so we can continue to share excellent programs like this, uh, because I think that it's so important to be able to bring these things forward and to share them broadly. And one of the advantages of the virtual event, of course, is that it could geographically go much more broadly than an in-person event, although the prior in-person events have also been live streamed simultaneously and, and we'll continue to do that with the initiatives in order to get uh, as broad a participation as possible. But again, Aaron, Bill, thank you so much. This has just been a wonderful morning and we're so grateful to both of you for sharing all this information with us. Thank you so much. And I think that concludes our program. It was extraordinary, didn't it?